Hello, I'm Steve Nunn, President and CEO of The Open Group. Welcome to Toolkit Tuesday, where we highlight the various components and leading experts of the Architects Toolkit, a collated portfolio of the most pertinent technology standards for enterprise architects. During the series, I'll be calling on a number of recognized experts who will bring their particular insights on how to most effectively use the various tools in the Architects Toolkit. We'll have a mix of interviews, panel sessions, and pre-recorded presentations along the way. While all standards of the Open Group are designed so they can be adopted independently of one another, the greatest value for an organization can be derived when they're used in unison. The sum of the parts should be greater than the whole. In the Architects Toolkit, we have collated a portfolio of the most pertinent ones for architects together, all in one place. For most of these tools, certification from the Open Group is also available, so practitioners can demonstrate that they have the skills required, and recruiters can take the guesswork out of the recruitment process, all backed up by our Open Badges program. Welcome everyone, welcome to Toolkit Tuesday. Thank you for joining us today. We have a lot of people registered for this event, so uh, uh, all from all around the world. So uh, do do uh, take a moment to let us know where you are if you can in the chat channel. We'd love to uh, love to get that going and uh, and share the different locations of the uh, uh, of our attendees today. But delighted to have you with us today. Can you believe this is our tenth Toolkit Tuesday? Uh, so over the last twenty weeks, we've uh, We've uh, brought a lot of uh, a lot of information and knowledge that's available on our website, so you can go back and uh, and see these if you missed any, or if there were any you, you particularly found useful, you can go and see them again. And today um, we have one that really really sums up what Toolkit Tuesday is all about: um, using the, the availability of open standards and using standards together. And um, I think it's going to be a great. Uh, a great session and uh, there's some homework afterwards which is to uh, read a book which you will find um, very easy and approachable to read i strongly encourage you to do that but uh, so today we are we are talking about how to leverage open standards to accelerate digital transformation and to take us through that today um, and in fact, before I go there, sorry, just one thing. If you want to ask a question today, I should have done this at the beginning. If you want to ask a question today, please do so in the Q&A channel rather than the chat channel. Let us know where you are in the chat channel, but use the Q&A channel to um, ask questions if you would, please. And if you can't see that, if you go to the bottom right-hand corner of, the, uh, of your screen, you'll see three dots to the right of the um, chat bubble three dots and if you click on those and then click on Q&A that will um, open up the Q&A channel for you and that's how we'd like to uh, to ask questions we won't have time for lots of questions but um, if you if you have one please uh, please put it in there and also um, our um, speakers today will do their best to answer questions in the channel if you if you ask them so as I was saying um, to take us through our talk today, we have um, a threesome, a triple act, um, and I'll introduce them all now and then uh, and then hand over to them. So the first is um, Stephanie Ramsey, who is Senior Principal IT Architect Manager at Raytheon Technologies. Stephanie's worked for more than 30 years in the information and digital technology world with extensive experience in service delivery, applications and infrastructure in three industries, defense, healthcare, and retail. Stephanie is a leading authority in business architecture and product service integration with strong competencies in enterprise architecture, portfolio management, business relationship management, service management, sourcing and supplier management, and program management. Stephanie is also an active member of the Open Group IT for IT and Architecture Forums and is currently serving as a customer representative on our governing board. So welcome, Stephanie. Thank you for joining us. Uh, next up, you'll hear from Case van den Brink, who is Senior Manager of Platform Architects at ServiceNow. After being an officer in the Merchant Marines, Case started his career in IT as a developer working in a team to maintain a network administration system. Over time, Case has been a sales engineer, a solution architect, a platform architect, an architecture practice lead, and an, and an engagement lead. Currently, Case works for ServiceNow, managing a team of platform architects for the northern part of Europe. 
He's a strong believer in initiatives that help to bring standardization to life, like the IT for IT standard, which he helped to establish and maintain. And third, you will hear from Sylvain Marie, who is a consultant on IT and service delivery at Accenture. Sylvan has worked in information technology and service delivery for more than 30 years as a consultant. 15 years ago, he extended his experience into the field of enterprise architecture, and he's now a leading architect in IT for IT. He's certified in TOGAF, IT for IT, business architecture, and is an ITIL expert. He's been involved in ITSM and IT for IT consulting projects in major European companies. He also likes to share his experience in using TOGAF, IT for IT, and ITIL as a trainer and is an active member in the Open Group. So a warm welcome from the Open Group to our three presenters today. And a short version of what they will be talking about is they'll be talking about how open standards helped resolve three world real world uh, scenarios faced when deploying digital uh, technologies in an enterprise. The scenarios are based on the presenter's recently released novel, The Turning Point, Agile Architects Building a Digital Foundation. So first up today, um, you will hear from Stephanie Ramsey. A warm welcome for the open group for, for Stephanie Ramsey. Over to you. Welcome. Right. Thank you, Steve. That was a very nice intro. Um, just to give you a bit of a context uh, on The Turning Point, it's a book about a fictional company called Archie Insurance on a digital transformation journey. The story describes the foundational work that's necessary for companies that would like to deploy digital technology at a faster pace. Many of the open group standards are used throughout the story to solve problems that arise during the Archie Insurance digital transformation. Myself and two co-authors, Case and Sylvan, will each take you through a scenario out of the book. I chose a scenario on application rationalization to talk about. The main character in the story, Dr. Kathleen Stone, chief architect, is a strong proponent of working across value streams in cross-functional teams versus the way many organizations have tended to work in functional silos. In the silos, groups have focused primarily on their individual goals rather than common goals and outcomes for a value stream. The result of working in functional silos is often duplication of effort and the creation of redundant and disparate roles, processes, information, and tools in many organizations. In the novel, the fictional company called Arch Insurance had also gone through a merger and there was a lot of redundant applications in the ecosystem. This is also a common problem in organizations. This picture here is from the book called Digital, Designed for Digital and we reference it several times in our book. It depicts the silos that have been built in a lot of companies over the course of many years where there are lots of disparate processes, data, applications, and technology that have been created over time. As companies begin building their digital foundation, it is highly recommended that the core systems of record are identified and integrated and that the duplicate tools are removed from the ecosystem to reduce complexity. Application rationalization is a method for identifying and removing redundant and non-value added applications to free up budget for the business critical work that needs to be done and to simplify environments. The technical viability, risk, and how well applications meet business needs are assessed. Based on the findings, applications are designated for retirement, consolidation, or modernization. Application rationalization is an imperative for building a strong digital foundation because it reduces complexity in the environment and it renovates digital ecosystems. This is groundwork that, that can make an organization agile and adaptable to handle incoming digital demand for things like big data, cloud, and mobile. The IT for IT standard can be used to help guide the flow of data for digital products and service. There's also a guidance paper available in the Open Group Library called 
tool rationalization using the IT for IT reference architecture standard that gives the steps for an application or tool rationalization effort. This picture is from our book. Kathleen and her team are able to determine the core systems of record for their digital products and services by mapping the tools in their existing environment to the IT for IT digital product lifecycle. They were able to identify and eliminate all the tools that had redundant capabilities, narrowing it down to four core systems of record. The core systems of record were integrated so product information could flow digi digitally in an automated fashion versus all the previous manual intervention that had been necessary to keep information moving from one siloed group to the next. So, in summary, build a strong digital foundation by identifying your core systems of record eliminate duplication and redundancy in your ecosystem and build an integrated information thread through your core systems of record and organize teams around value streams to eliminate silos and stop the progression of disparate processes technology application and data application rationalization is referred to several times in the book but chapter eight is where you can find the product life cycle automation part of the story now I will turn this over to Case, and he will tell you about his scenario that includes the villain of our story, Hans Pickle. Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, discuss also the scenario that I picked, and it's one that uh, most of us who are working in IT uh, run into every now and then, which is uh, legacy systems, or more importantly, the replacement of legacy systems and the difficulty of it. The same truth for the company of our, uh, in our book, Arch Assurance. Uh, there's a prolongation application, which is known by the employees as the big, ludicrous old system, or BLOS, and which is seen as large and complex and is inflexible and needs to be replaced. Um, over the time, a number of attempts have been made to uh, replace the system, but until now, they, uh, they basically keep on failing to do this. And then Hans Pickle, uh, he's actually currently tasked to uh, replace the system and he and his team have been working on this uh, for a long time and taking a big bang approach, something that most companies are trying to do with legacy systems. Unfortunately, because of the focus of Hans is on replacement, he kind of doesn't ha have any room to do anything else. So which in itself is killing the new demand and therefore killing innovation and you know, the progress of the business. In fact, Hans is actively stopping anything which is, will change the prolongation system. The strange thing is that Hans in himself considers himself and his team to be the most mature in working agile in the company, given they are running Scrum and, for, uh, and doing standoffs for the last two years. But he fails to see that his own attitude towards change is more, uh, and more specifically the blocking of change, is actually not uh, agile. And it actually can be seen as an anti-pattern. So one can see that, consider this Hans to be the anti-hero of the book. In one of the scenes that we describe, Kathleen and Amy Lee, uh, Amy Lee is an agile coach that is helping the transformation of the organization. They're witnessing a heated argument between Hans and Ben Cohen. And Ben is a business analyst who's newly joined the company and is trying, and he's trying to convince Hans to really make a small change in this, uh, in this uh, prolongation application because he needs to uh, produce meaningful reports. Hans flat out refuses to do so and has no intent to help Ben any way, shape, or form. So he has no other option than let go of his demand. Luckily for Ben, Amy makes sure that Ben and Kathleen meet each other. And during the conversation, Amy gently coaches Kathleen into helping Ben with the solution. And they and then identify there's a way to go around the prolongation system, implementing something uh, that doesn't impact uh, uh, the, the replacement. Once the solution is, and Kathleen helps Ben to implement it over the course of the, the, the book. And once the solution is implemented and the word is out, all the parts of the organization start to engage with Kathleen and her team with requests of their own to help find solutions uh, to solve problems around this prolongation application. This is for me what is most important of being an architect. It's not about building diagrams or models. It's really about helping the business and helping finding directions of and solving issues and reducing the impact of those. 
Uh, and afterwards, Kathleen actually learns that the approach she has taken is well described. Uh, and in this way, it's called, it's described as the Stranger Flick Fig application by Martin Fowler, which we reference in the book, something that is assuring her in her approach to be correct. And that takes me to uh, the summary of uh, what I just described, and is that uh, you know it, be careful when you when you talk about agile and don't become uh, agile in name only or as I call it ano, because agile is not just doing stand-ups and 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 scrumming. It's really uh, it requires attention and it's not just done by developers. Also, architects in their role need to help the organization to be agile, serving the business to become this flexible that they need. And the second thing is that, um, uh, and, and we call this creating room, uh, 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 creating room to breathe by strangling the strangler fig application, is not uh, it's as an architect is not just about creating diagrams and models. It's doing uh, doing the architecture for architecture's sake doesn't make sense. It's more about finding solutions, and as with the strangler fig actually uh, pattern, it's basically finding ways around uh, 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 finding solutions. In this case, like finding ways around the legacy system. And this leads me to the third item in the summary, the learning, and that is that standards and frameworks are not just about being a reference architecture or providing a set of rules or something like that. Standards typically have much more value in them. Embedded in standards like the Open Agile Architecture or the Digital Protection Book of Knowledge, you find a lot of pointers to knowledge that can help find solve issues. Often they're used to explain the standards and the way they work, but in itself, they are valuable as well for architects. With that, I would like to hand over to Sylvain to take us to the third scenario. Yes, in uh, this last scenario, um, the lead architect, uh, Kathleen Stone, uh, she gets a call during her vacation from uh, one of her colleagues. And um, what her colleague says is that uh, they, they are facing a major incident because customers cannot access anymore the digital platform. And uh, more than that, uh, all the monitoring systems are down, which prevents the support team to uh, correctly diagnose uh, the cause of the problem. So um, they try to investigate all the changes that has been approved during the last three weeks, and none of them relates to uh, the actual uh, problem. So finally, uh, Kathleen Stone, um, says uh, that maybe the best uh, way to uh, diagnose this problem was to look at all the investments that has been approved uh, recently and uh, that maybe with that they, they could uh, find what is the cause, the root cause of the problem. So um, after that, uh, she goes, uh, Kathleen goes through the security at the airport and suddenly she realized that uh, the problem uh, was probably due to the security platform, a new version of the security platform that has been approved uh, recently. And effectively, uh, this was the, the real cause of the problem. Uh, the, this new version of the security platform uh, has implemented new security policies that uh, creates the problem on the digital platform. And uh, also this new version of the security platform as an artificial intelligence mechanism that reapplies the policies each time the support team was trying to correct the problem. So from this uh, incident, uh, Kathleen looked at uh, uh, what the reference, IT for IT reference architecture, and mainly in, uh, in the, the last, um, value stream, which is the, the operate or the, or the detect correct value, value stream, what would uh, try to uh, prevent the same type of problem to happen again. And finally, uh, if I go to the summary, they, she decides to uh, implement two solutions from uh, the IT for IT reference architecture. Uh, the first solution was to provide a consolidated view of all the changes both manual changes, but also automated changes. So manual changes that go through the cab, but automated changes uh, that uh, were not, uh, of course, going through a, through a change advisory board. Uh, so one of the main aspects was to include the DevOps tool chain 
in the change control mechanism and to be sure to have a centralized register of all the changes that happen uh, in the production environment. The second solution she decided to implement was to build a digital product backbone. So the digital product backbone is something that is uh, recommended by the IT for IT reference architecture and that allows to uh, compare what is actually implemented in the production environment, what we call the, the digital product instance, uh, with uh, what is what is supposed to be in production in the production environment, which we called the desired product instance. So by com comparing the desired product instance and the real um, actual configuration in the production environment, we are able to detect an approved change, and so that will really help um, to uh, to diagnose this uh, this unapproved change and uh, that will uh, prevent the same problem to happen again so you can find the you can learn more and find how this uh, has been implemented and uh, and uh, presented in the book in the chapter 6 of the turning point novel Well, thank you, thank you, and uh, thank you to Case and Stephanie as well. That uh, that concludes the uh, the run through today. So, uh, great job, everyone, and uh, thoroughly recommend the uh, the book. As I say, it's very approachable. It's an easy read, um, and uh, there's a question in the Q and A as to where you can find it, and uh, Case has answered. But you can see it on the slide uh, that's up right now. You can find it on the open group uh, in the library. Um, either by its document name, G219, or you can um, purchase a book from Van Haren Publishing. Um, so anyway, the details are there where you can find it, and I thoroughly uh, encourage you to uh, uh, to uh, uh, get the book and uh, and and read it. It's uh, it's a great example of using standards together, which I said at the beginning is uh, is what Toolkit Tuesday is all about. So let's have um, a few questions if uh, if we can. Um, so, Stephanie, you led us off. Um, um, so, uh, I'll aim this one. I'll aim this one at you because it's something you rent, you mentioned. Um, what do you identify uh, as core systems of records? You mentioned that in your in your presentation. Um, how do, how how do you identify those? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, a lot of companies over time, because of the silos that we've been in, we've tended to have, uh, come up with like a lot of redundancy and duplication. And so there, so it's hard when you're trying to build integrations to build a whole bunch of integrations to a whole bunch of, of all of these disparate systems. So uh, what we recommend is that you take a look and see where that duplication is, do the application rationalization and eliminate all of the things that you don't really need in your environment, figure out what are those core systems of record that you really need to have in your environment and, and build your integrations um, throughout those core systems of records. And IT for IT really does help you a lot with um, the digital product life cycle and figuring out what is the information that needs to flow all the way from your strategy into development uh, through operations, and then finally, when you have to retire something. So, um, I use it quite a, quite often to to help me kind of figure out what are, what is the core information that I really need, uh, and and what systems do I have that provide that core information. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Case. If I can uh, point one at uh, one of these at you. Um, you you stress the importance of uh, of being agile and not not just being agile in name only. But do you need to be an agile company or or skilled in running agile practices inside the organization to be able to benefit from concepts like the strangler fig pattern that you mentioned? Yeah, that's a great uh, question, uh, Steve. Yeah, actually, you don't have to be. Um, the, 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 the beauty of architecture is this, it, it helps you when you want to become agile, it helps you uh, with the standards of what to do, uh, especially the uh, agile architecture, as well as DP Box, which I mentioned, uh, they, they're proponents of, uh, of running an organization agile. But it doesn't mean that the concepts and the structures that are being provided and the solutions that you can apply 
but they can only be done if you're running agile. I mean, the Springer flick, flick pattern itself is something that you can do in, in, in any uh, type of organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, as so also in the book itself, uh, um, um, Arch Assurance is in a transformation itself. So they're becoming digital and they're more and more becoming uh, known to what it is to be running an agile organization. And in that sense, they when they start to apply some of those solutions, they're not even agile at that moment in time. They, they fail to become agile, but over the time, they actually learn how to apply it in, in more and better ways, including failures of the architects themselves. You know, they sometimes fail in what they do and then learn from it and then improve. So by all means, it's can... fail. Surely not. Surely not. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but it does happen. Yeah. Yeah. No. And it's it's you know it's part of the uh, part of the digital transformation journey is uh, is is learning how to do uh, how, what works, what doesn't work, and how when yeah. to use and, that and job uh, when you can't. Yeah. Yeah. And learn as an organization uh, exactly. from from the mistakes. Yeah. Exactly. So talking of digital and and things, uh, Sylvan, you mentioned a digital product backbone. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, sure. Uh, the digital product backbone are um, a set of seven data objects that are part of the, the information model that is proposed by the uh, IT for IT reference architecture. And these uh, seven data objects are, are all linked together. And this allows to follow the complete life cycle of the digital product. So you are able to link the, the digital products in, in the first phase of its existence in, in the strategy phase and you are able to follow uh, and, and to uh, really record what happens during all the life cycle so going from the strategy going through the development of the digital product the design and the development and after going through the, the delivering so, so the of the, the digital product and finally to the production environment and uh, in the scenario uh, we used two of these seven data objects uh, that are the, the last two from the, the, the deliver phase and the production phase in order to be able to uh, uh, discover the unimproved change, as I said. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, it, we've, we've probably got time for, for one more question, maybe two at most, but um, we won. There, there are a number of standards that are referenced in the novel. Um, can you speak to which what standards they are and, and why you felt it was important to include them. Um, whoever wants to take that one. Well, we started out with, we were gonna write some guidance around uh, Archimate, TOGAF and it for it So those are the primary ones that we wrote about in the book, but then as we got into it, we found out about more open group standards that were relevant that we could actually use for digital transformation. So we learned a lot in the, the process. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. And that, that's a great message because um, a lot of people know the open group for maybe one standard or one area, but when they, when they um, explore a bit more, there is, uh, there is much more breadth there. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we uh, will be working on increasingly is um, uh, as into next year and uh, during next year is bringing these things together, you know, making them more uh, more usable um, in connection with each other. So um, well, that, well, that's great. Um, so are any of the characters, I'll, I'll just ask this last one, are any of the characters in the book um, based on anyone in real life? Uh, <laughs> apart, from the, apart from the fact that you very kindly created a character called Steve Nunn, um, are, are any of the others uh, based on anyone in real life? Uh, apart from yourself, the, the, the other ones are all uh, made up by ourselves as characters. Uh, I mean, the experience we have is obviously used, but it's not like you can recognize anybody yeah. in the real world as uh, representing one of the characters. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, it's a real model from that perspective. That's great. I well, based Kathleen actually on what I would like my career to be so <laughs> <laughs> well that's good that's good well um stephanie case sylvan thank you very much for leading us through today and as i say to uh, uh, as i've said before and else I'll, I'll i'll keep saying until somebody listens go download the book read the book um it's a it's a great um uh, a great example of how how some of our standards can be used together for real business purposes and to make a real difference so uh, 
a big virtual round of applause to the three of you. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you very much. And um, we'll we'll uh, leave uh, that topic today. So that's the end of the tenth episode of Talk It Tuesday. Um, please join us again, though, in two weeks' time, December fourteenth. Um, where we will be actually focusing on modeling. So one of the standards that is in, is in the book, the Archimate modeling language, uh, we're going to have a session on using the Archimate modeling language in real life examples, um, led by pa Patrick Dede and Marianne Kubel. So join us in two weeks time. Meanwhile, keep safe and have a good couple of weeks and uh, go read that book. Take care, everyone. I'm Steve Nunn. This was Toolkit Tuesday. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.